Okay. Then um, I guess we're ready to start. Uh, good or good morning, after everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. We are so happy to see that so many people from all over join us, and that so many are interested in learning from our experience with supporting companies bridging the gap between control loop performance and process performance. My name is Magnus Dagesta, and I'm part of the process performance team here at ABB. I'm sitting in Stavanger, Norway. It's a beautiful day here in Stavanger, and I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are too. It's always exciting to see that such a diverse group is interested in our topics, and we look forward to sharing our experience and insights from more than 40 sites across the world. In a few seconds, I will let Thomas get the floor for the main bulk of the presentation. But before that, I would like to give you a heads up on some practicalities. The webinar is scheduled to take about one hour, 45 minutes for the presentation, and then the remainder for uh, questions. You can ask questions during the talk by posting them in the Q&A feature, uh, which you hopefully find in the bottom right of your screen. The webinar will be made available online in a few days. So if you need to refer back to anything, uh, you should be able to find it where you signed up for the talk. Finally, um, at the end of this presentation, we are showing you something that we haven't really talked about a lot outside ABB, and we're really excited to get your feedback on it. And so without further ado, I'm happy to introduce uh, Thomas Ronmo. Thomas tuned his first loop in 1997 as a part of his automation technician schooling. Later, he pursued an education within automation and cybernetics and received his master's degree. And since joining ABB in 2008, he has been working with process improvements in industrial assets. Until 2018, he was working hands-on, mostly out on customer sites, and since then in his current role. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Magnus, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining. I think I will uh, start off uh, with uh, going through the basics uh, real uh, real quick, just uh, so we're on the same page, at least in terms of uh, terminology. And for this, I'll, I'll do a uh, use an uh, example. Um, so uh, imagine an industrial plant. Uh, it receives uh, continuous feed, it processes the feed, and then it exports uh, the product uh, uh, without, uh, in this certain case, any automation. Okay, so this plant has, uh, instead of, uh, it, it has a hundred, around 100 operators uh, running around on the factory floor, adjusting equipment uh, such as uh, valves, heaters, uh, and motors, uh, in order to maintain the, the temperature, pressure levels, flow, or whatever you need to uh, make your finished product. Uh, and, uh, in this example, uh, one of the operators uh, I have uh, chosen to name him Paul. His job, his job is to uh, make sure that the temperature of a uh, liquid flowing in a pipe is heated up to 90 degrees before the liquids enters uh, the tank. Now, uh, to do that, he uh, watches a temperature uh, display and he adjusts uh, the heater power. If the temperature uh, drops below, uh, lower than 90 degrees, he slightly increases the power of the heater. Of course, he again watches the temperature display, and if uh, the temperature is still below 90 degrees, he increases the power slightly more. And of course, continues this process until he reaches 90 degrees. Uh, the same procedure can, of course, be done by lowering the heater power if the heat, uh, temperature is lower than 90 degrees. Paul's job is an example of a control loop consists of uh, the process, uh, heating uh, the fluid. Uh, it has a measurement, in this case, a temperature measurement. Uh, it has a controller, pole, and an actuator. Uh, here, the heater element. Now, uh, Paul has a colleague, and uh, let's call him John. And John's job uh, is to keep the liquid of a level in a tank at 50%, and he does that by operating a valve uh, that's upstream the same pipe as Paul. And John's job is also an example of a control loop. He watches the level, and if the level is higher than 50%, he opens the valve slightly, 
and it watches the level again, adjusts the valve until the level is around 50%. And there is equilibrium in the amount of fluid going into the tank and fluid going out of the tank. However, each time John adjusts uh, the opening of uh, his valve, Paul uh, gets a little bit annoyed uh, because just as Paul had reached the perfect heater power setting to stabilize the temperature at 90 degrees, John opens uh, his valve and uh, lets in more cold water. The cold water uh, decreases the temperature of Paul's liquid and now Paul has to get up uh, out of his chair and uh, readjust the heater power to get it back up to 90 degrees. Uh, this is, this is uh, what we call an example of a disturbance. One, uh, one loop, in this case John, disturbing another temperature loop, in uh, this case Paul. And these disturbances, they can have uh, many sources. Uh, it may be someone starting a pump. You might have an, an evil feed into your plant, uh, unstable control loops, a valve might be opening somewhere in the process. Uh, and you can even have control logic that cause sudden bumps or changes in the process. The point is that industrial processes uh, are constantly exposed to disturbances. And uh, this is one of the most important reasons why we have control loops. You can say in essence, jobs, the Paul's job is really, really simple. If there were no disturbances, he could in theory adjust the heater once to reach approximately 90 degrees and then take a week uh, vacation. Temperature would not change at all if all other process conditions remain constant. John's job, on the other hand, uh, it needs constant surveillance. He's watching what we call a naturally unstable process. His job is to keep the liquid level in the tank at 50%. If he tried to find uh, the perfect valve opening to maintain 50% level in the tank, he would have to 100% match the flow into the tank, which is basically impossible. Even if he missed by only 1%, the tank would eventually uh, overflow or uh, be completely emptied. That is the second reason why we need control loops to stabilize unstable processes. The third reason is set point changes, but those are really rare. Uh, the analogy to a set point change might be if Someone uh, asked uh, Paul, "Can you uh, change the set point to 100 and uh, change the temperature to 110 degrees?" Paul would then have to get up and, and readjust uh, the heater power, increase the heater power, and watch the temperature sensor until it reached 110 degrees. Uh, now back in the real world. Um, most uh, industrial processes uh, use PID controllers. So instead of having people such as Paul and John to maintain critical process conditions, we use PID controllers. Uh, they do basically the same job. Uh, the PID controller uses a measurement as an input. Uses a measurement uh, as an input. Then uh, you select the temperature, level, flow, or pressure value that you want to maintain. And the PID controller makes sure that the measurement stays on this selected value by calculating an output that is connected to the heater. Uh, it might also be a valve, motor, or whatever you need to control your process. And industrial plants often have uh, hundreds of uh, these PID uh, control loops. Typically, uh, control loops are monitored by only a few operators sitting in a central control room. And uh, these two or three operators have to rely uh, that uh, these PID control loops perform. Now, unfortunately, PID control loops does not work out of the box. And uh, control loop performance therefore varies a lot. To uh, separate uh, the control loop performance, I have here uh, divided performance and operator stress level into uh, four categories. The, the worst performing control, control loops might cause more problems than they solve, uh, in which case uh, the operator usually disables the controller and sets it into manual control. In this situation, you're basically back to the example with Paul and John. 
manually controlling the process, uh, except Paul and John has packed his bags and uh, left for vacation. Uh, if most of your control loops are in this category, the few operators that are left in the control room will have to have a lot of events to uh, pay attention to. Uh, this will typically cause symptoms such as uh, frustrated and stressed operators might get uh, frequent uh, process segment shutdowns. You can have uh, poor uh, product quality, emissions, reduced production or uh, even uh, high uh, energy usage. Uh, some loops might be a little bit better. They work in normal conditions, but typically they fail to work during startup or large disturbances. The operator will therefore put these control loops in manual during these events. So how startups or disturbances uh, are handled will depend on what shift of operators that are currently working and uh, what kind of methods they're using and of course the experience of the operator. Um, for example, if, um, if you have a flow uh, that needs to be redirected or a process segment that needs to be started, then the startup time or and the risk of failure of the operation will vary from shift to shift. Disturbances uh, also pose a risk as it will depend on the no uh, operator noticing the issue in time and being able to save the process. However, even experienced operators forget to do this and uh, uh, if there are too many of these critical events to handle, uh, it will eventually compromise the quality of the product, uh, the shutdown of the production or compromise uh, the safety and uh, of the process and uh, personnel. Then you have the well-behaved control loops. These control loops, they can handle startup, they handle disturbances, and the operator does not really need to intervene. Uh, what, is, what is lacking from this category are all the process or equipment conditions that are not controlled. In other words, um, if you have an industrial plant, it will be designed with a given set of PID control loops. And these PID control loops control a given set of process conditions, but there will always remain many operations that should have been continuously controlled, uh, but instead they are uh, performed manually or they might be controlled using complicated binary logic. And opportunities uh, in this final category, in category number four, differ from the last three. Because in the, la the first three categories, you, to an extent, can see that you have an issue and you try to fix it. Uh, it's possible to observe that the loop is os uh, oscillating, that you have disturbances uh, that uh, cause problems or you, you have controllers in manual. But it's not always easy to see what I call category four uh, control opportunities and unless you actually, actually look for them. Uh, for example, Let's say you have an export compressor. It might be running at uh, seemingly full capacity because it's capped uh, by binary logic to stay below some uh, max RPM. But it has been shown that by installing an additional control loop, you can increase uh, capacity by many percent. So I would say if the first three categories are about surviving and making it work, uh, the last category is about uh, really thriving and getting the most out of uh, your uh, process. And um, yeah, in, in my, my impression, impression is uh, most or at least uh, offshore oil and gas plants, uh, they fall somewhere in between category two and three. But there is always some part, uh, some part in every plant, some process segment that is worse than others. My impression is also that third-party systems uh, often have control uh, issues, uh, such as uh, can be issues such as uh, water treatment, tag packages, or compressor control. Um, common mistake here is uh, that control loops often uh, are fixed one by one, uh, when what you actually need is a more holistic approach, and you look at the performance of 
the whole plant, including third party packages, uh, to get the best uh, results. On the bottom here, I have uh, I have summarized uh, the results. If you go from the category one uh, control uh, uh, issues, uh, you have poor control loops uh, with the performance that leads to, uh, of course, increased operational risk, and this will directly affect um, operational profit. And if you go all the way over to category four, you have really reduce the operational risk and this naturally has a positive effect on both operator stress level and uh, operator operational profit. Next, we will look at uh, tuning of uh, control loops and what you need to consider at least to get out of uh, category uh, one and category two. Um, so the setting here is that uh, we have replaced Paul from the last section with a PID control loop. Uh, the PID controller is connected to a temperature measurement and to a power uh, converter. Uh, and this power converter is setting the heater power. But as we know, a PID control loop does not work out of the box. Uh, and the most famous parameters that needs to be determined are P for proportional, I for integral, and D for uh, derivative. Now, in, in theory, uh, all you need to know, uh, all you need to do is to perform a bump test. This is an efficient way for determining parameters. And uh, after you've done the test, you can read out some key numbers that you get out of the bump test and plug these into uh, any tuning rule. Uh, this uh, tuning rule will then again give you PID. Uh, uh, controller parameters. So what we usually do is that we start with the P and I uh, parameters with a derivative uh, term uh, disabled. And uh, to perform the test, uh, you need uh, access to a trending tool and, um, and a PID uh, controller, obviously. Uh, so what you do is that uh, you set the controller in uh, manual. This is basically the same as disabling the controller and uh, you manually control the, the actuator, or in this case, the heater element. Uh, then you wait uh, on, uh, you look at your measurement and you wait until the temperature stabilizes. Um, after you see that the temperature is stationary, you can change the heater output uh, to a new value as shown here. Uh, what you will typically see then is a shape like this. Uh, the response needs to be fitted to a black box model and the simplest and in most cases sufficient model is the first order response plus uh, time delay. The parameters uh, that you need to know are first of all the time delay, that is the time from uh, you have done uh, the step in the heater and until it start, the temperature starts moving. The next is the time constant which is approximately 63% of the total change in temperature. And then last, it's uh, the gain, which is the total change in temperature divided by the total change in output. Now, based on these three uh, model values, you have the basis uh, to select from a, ra from a range of uh, tuning equations. And there is a lot to choose from. Um, the point is uh, that you now have the values uh, you need for a dynamic model, and uh, these are the parameters that will determine the tuning. I will not go into the theory here, as it can be found basically anywhere on the internet or uh, in a short uh, tuning course. Um, but instead, we'll look at uh, what you should consider when you do this in practice. Um, because first you uh, create the step response and before you start the first rule, do not trip or cause any uh, problems in the process that are already running. Uh, if you do a step response, for example, uh, in a heater, the first thing would be to identify what will happen uh, when I do the step. In the heater example, this is uh, fairly straightforward because if you increase heater power, the temperature will increase. And if you decrease 
heater power, uh, the temperature will decrease. And next, uh, you should be aware of any alarm or trip limits. Um, will the step I'm about to do cause any issues? If the temperature is 90 degrees and the alarm limit is 95, well, maybe you should not do your step response by increasing power. And the second thing is to be aware of is uh, how will how will both the step response and the tuning uh, affect uh, other loops? For example, if you were doing a step response on John's level controller, as we talked about before, you will disturb Paul's temperature, uh, no level controller, will disturb Paul's temperature controller downstream. And so you need to be aware um, not only of the process conditions that you're making a model for, but how you might affect all other process conditions. And if, um, and if you see that things are start going wrong when you do the step, uh, process conditions are moving in some undesirable direction, you should have made a plan beforehand for how you can get back to normal. Setting the PID controller back to auto might not be your best uh, option. Then, uh, of course, there is the size of the step. Often uh, you have have noise uh, or disturbances on the signal, so the step needs to be large enough to give you a response that you can read, but uh, it should also be so small that you don't disturb the rest of the process. Personally, I prefer uh, to start uh, with small steps, increase the step size until I have the response I need. Now, uh, finally, um, you want to uh, do the step response in both directions. Some equipment and processes will give you a different response uh, when you increase the output from, from when you decrease the output. Now, once you're happy with the model uh, parameters that you've uh, found, uh, the gain, the time delay, the time constant, uh, you can use it in some uh, tuning method. But uh, before you plug in your calculated uh, PID parameters into your controller, there are a couple of things to consider. Uh, the first thing is uh, controller algorithm. The tuning method that you've cho chosen might be based on a different PID controller algorithm than what you have in your control system. So you need to verify and convert uh, the, your numbers accordingly. In addition, uh, pl um, your plant probably have a few third-party systems uh, with uh, their own control system. And PID control algorithms in this system probably differ a lot from the algorithm you have in your main system. I have encountered quite a few of third-party systems with their own homemade PID controller algorithm, and those can be very different, and uh, it will have a completely different behavior than what you might expect. And many of these are pretty buggy as well and might need reprogramming. A uh, second thing to consider is the range uh, of your analog input and analog output card. Uh, these ranges needs to be part of your calculation or you might get an uh, PID uh, parameters that are also completely wrong. A whole tip I would say is uh, to never make uh, large changes to your PID parameters. If you want to go from 0.1 in proportional gain to 100, then uh, you probably have you have probably done something wrong. And uh, even if you know that you have the correct parameters, you should uh, change them in incremental steps. Now, this procedure I've found will help you tune your controller to ensure that it's stable. Uh, however, you don't have any guarantee that it will protect you against disturbances and that it will actually work during startup or other process conditions that different differ from normal production. So to illustrate that, uh, I'll have a couple of examples. Uh, the first one, uh, let's say that uh, you are controlling, you're controlling uh, the pressure of a gas uh, in a tank. And uh, the tank, uh, the gas is used to uh, fuel four uh, turbines. Now, if four of these turbines are uh, running and one of them stops, there will be a spike in uh, pressure. 
because the flow into the tank is larger uh, than what goes out of the tank. In, now, in this situation, you need to know that your pressure controller is fast enough to handle um, this disturbance without activating the high, high pressure alarm uh, or a pressure trip. So, and there are tuning methods that will help you to ensure that tuning is good enough using a first order model with the time delay to, together with either historical process data of previous disturbances or maybe theoretically uh, through determining how much gas one turbine is using. Now let's say that uh, your PID controller is tuned and it can handle this situation from going from uh, three, four turbines uh, to uh, three turbines. Uh, this does not mean that will handle the situation when you have two turbines running and one stops. And that, I would say, is uh, pretty, uh, pretty annoying. Um, the, the reason for this uh, Change in behavior is, of course, uh, nonlinearity. The first order model that you made uh, with gain, time constant, and time delay, uh, it had a high gain when uh, you were uh, running uh, four, four turbines, which helped you suppress uh, the disturbances. But at the lower flow, the gain was suddenly smaller, and the controller is now not able to suppress the disturbance, uh, and you ended up tripping. Another example of um, a first order uh, model that is changing because of these uh, non-linearities uh, is the response of a heat exchanger uh, that is used to cool a liquid. Here you have a process fluid uh, flowing in and uh, out of a heat exchanger and it's cooled uh, down by a uh, cooling fluid. The cooling, uh, uh, the process temperature is controlled by measuring the process fluid on the output and then controlling the amount of uh, cooling uh, fluid. So uh, let's say that uh, let's say that uh, you made um, first order model plus time delay, and uh, you found uh, that you have a gain about uh, 0.5. Uh, the time delay is seven seconds, and the time constant is uh, 40 seconds. Uh, you found out this using the bump test, and the test is done at normal. Uh, production conditions, uh, let's say um, around 900 cubic meters per hour. And you observe that uh, the calculated uh, PID parameters worked fine, and the process was stable. Then you go home, and the next day you, uh, you get a complaint uh, from, um, from uh, the operators. Uh, what they say is that uh, everything has been oscillating, and uh, and uh, they had to uh, disable. Uh, they had to disable uh, the loop. So what you do then? You uh, you do a new uh, step response, and uh, you notice that uh, the model parameters have uh, changed. The gain is now suddenly doubled. Uh, the time delay is twenty one seconds instead of seven seconds. The time constant is one hundred and twenty five seconds instead of forty seconds. And since you based your tuning on the former model parameters, you now have an stable uh, process. This is a familiar problem, uh, but how do you deal with it? Um, usually, when doing step responses, you are allowed to do a step response uh, of the process around the current production rate. So if you're producing through a heat exchanger that is uh, around 900 cubic meters per hour, you might be able to do a step response at 800 cubic meters and a thousand, but never at 200 cubic meters per hour. It's it's difficult to give an exact answer to this in a short talk like this, but it's a lot of information in uh, plant documentation that uh, can help together with uh, analyzing static models of the system. Of course, the first order model combined with tuning parameters also give you 
valuable information about the gain and phase margins that uh, can uh, that you can use to estimate how much your model parameters can change before you run into trouble. Now, of course, I'm going to level with you. You don't need to do this for absolutely or control loops. For some loops, um, normal tuning with enough uh, high gain and phase margin is sufficient. But uh, what you need to know is which loop uh, for which loops do you need to consider these nonlinearities? And I guess uh, that is where the real challenge lies. Uh, if we uh, zoom out a little bit uh, and take a look at the control loop as a whole, uh, you can see all the elements uh, that it uh, consists of. As we have uh, talked about, uh, the PID controller with its inputs and output cards are connected to the final control element. Um, in our example, this was Paul's adjustable heater. And we looked at the process. In our example, it was a fluid that was heated up. And finally, uh, the measurement, uh, in this case, the temperature sensor that sends uh, the signal to the PID uh, controller. The point uh, of this uh, illustration uh, is that the control loop is uh, much more than a proportional integral and derivative parameters of the PID controller. If you change one of the properties of one of these elements, uh, it will change the total behavior of the loop. For example, if the final uh, control element, the final control element is a valve, the valve might have its own characteristics. Uh, it might also have an internal loop for controlling the position of the valve. Or um, the behavior might change because new uh, operating conditions in the process or in the sensor where you set the range, uh, you set density of the liquid uh, or uh, filter parameters that affects the total behavior. And to top it off, uh, each, uh, each of these elements in the control loop ha usually have their own uh, responsible disciplines. Uh, the final control element, for example, can have uh, can can be a valve. Uh, it can be a motor, a pump. It can even be a compressor. In which case, a technician or an engineer from instrument, electrical or mechanical will uh, have to be involved. The process conditions will usually be the responsibility of the process engineers, and the control of the plant will be performed by an operator. In other words, uh, in order to get the control loop set up correctly to, and to get out of at least category one and two, I don't think it's an understatement to say that technical insight uh, into this discipline together with operational experience is an advantage and uh, it needs to be coordinated. That is uh, usually why we say that the uh, role of the process control engineer needs to be cross-disciplinary. Uh, so, so to summarize uh, the talking points, uh, I have um, I put up uh, the questions. So what you need to consider when tuning your loop. The first is, um, uh, as we mentioned before, what is the purpose of your loop? How, uh, how will this affect uh, the process condition of your loop and other loops? What algorithms uh, is your PID controller using when implementing it uh, from a PID uh, tuning method? And uh, also, what is the range of my analog input and analog output card? Because it will affect your gain. Also, uh, what disturbances can you expect? Uh, how do you, uh, how do you uh, plan to uh, deal with it? And uh, also, uh, are there any non-linearities I should uh, be concerned with? and how they deal with that. Also, uh, added the uh, last point here about control structures that are uh, really important. I have not go, gone into that in this uh, talk, but uh, this is also something that uh, is uh, at least as important as uh, controller tuning. So based on... Uh, so based on the previous discussion uh, that we've uh, had, uh, I thought we could have a quick look at uh, some of the some popular tuning methods. The first and most popular 
uh, method might unfortunately be a trial and error. That is, uh, the plant uh, is uh, in production and you tune the PID control group by slightly adjusting on the P, I and D parameters until you start noticing a better control loop performance. The drawback of this method is uh, you have absolutely no information about um, how the loop uh, handles disturbances or if it will actually work when you change process conditions. With even small changes in the process condition, you risk um, making the loop unstable. This It might be tempting to use this method, uh, trial and error, if your loop is already oscillating, but there is no guarantee that the P, I or D parameters uh, are causing this oscillation. Uh, it might be a disturbance from another part of the process or equipment issues in which case uh, you risk causing more operational problems uh, for uh, for yourself. Then you have the um, autotune uh, method. Um, and this uh, this method uses a uh, uh, built-in algorithm that helps you find the PID uh, parameters. The algorithm typically starts by running a test sequence uh, for making uh, its own black box model and then uh, using the test sequence model for calculating the P, I, and D parameters. Um, but with Autotune, it's easy to forget uh, that this is only a tool for tuning. It does not account for all other parts of the process, such as valve stiction, disturbances uh, during tuning, instrument issues, or other problems that might occur. Also, you still need a strategy for how to qualify the calculated parameters uh, in order um, to both account for nonlinear changes in the process and uh, how should you deal with disturbances. So all in all, I uh, would say that auto-tune requires much of the same competency when tuning uh, as when tuning with step responses, at least if you want, uh, if you want a decent result. And now um, the last method um, is uh, we can look at is uh, model-based tuning or digital twins. The idea here is that you tune your model uh, in safe conditions and then you copy over the parameters you have calculated, tested and qualified uh, with, uh, with your model. And then you copy it over to the real world uh, PID controller. And with this approach, uh, you are free for, to, for testing, tuning at all process conditions, and you can make uh, any mistake that you would like without calling, uh, causing any issues. And, and that is worth a lot. Um, however, for tuning parameters uh, to be correct, they will depend on the underlying model dynamics being one-to-one -one with the real world process. And in my experience, this can vary greatly. If uh, a model time constant or a time delay or gain is different from the real world, then the calculated parameters will also be wrong, obviously. Uh, even with the, what we call a high fidelity model, there will always be unmodeled and unknown effects that makes the model dynamics different from the real world. I have often encountered uh, time constants uh, in models being three times la larger in the real world than it was in the calculated model. And I would say that models and simulators are a great tool for testing functionality. And uh, if you have created some new control structure, I would definitely test it on the model first. But uh, I would be very careful about copying over parameters found on a model to the real world. Now, uh, if you believe uh, that you have uh, some issues with control loops and you want to get out of uh, category one or three, uh, one or two, and uh, you, or you want to look for opportunities to make your plant best in class, uh, the process performance section in ABB have uh, for the last 20 years worked with identifying operational issues and uh, opportunities uh, related to dynamic control. Uh, in uh, the process uh, performance uh, unit, we have 25 specialists uh, that together have been more than 
150,000 hours in the control room with operations, solving practical control issues. And uh, in this time, we have developed and refined uh, our own best practices and internal tools uh, for both automatic and uh, effective analysis. Uh, we also have a library of uh, control solutions and specialized uh, control applications that we have proven in uh, operations. Um, and so our tools and uh, our experience uh, allows us to uh, allows us to um, quickly identify and realize uh, new opportunities and uh, this shortening the time uh, to value. And as uh, as our solutions uh, library have been tried and tested uh, at more than 40 sites, uh, they are uh, likely more likely to generate better results uh, and provide a higher value than custom-made first-time installations. Some of these, uh, some of our, our results uh, include uh, a reduction in uh, process shutdowns by 20%, um, emissions and energy uh, uh, usage reduction by 20%, and increased production of up to 10 percent so for control uh, loop performance uh, as we've talked about today uh, process performance uh, can offer the tailored service for improving your plant and uh, now i'll let uh, magnus have a quick introduction to this uh, magnus thank you thomas uh, next slide perhaps so um, here you can see a typical engagement timeline for a process performance delivery and how we think it can be done most efficiently with the shortest time to value. As shown here, it all starts with a kickoff workshop where we agree on what data should be extracted and from whom it is best to get first-hand knowledge of your process. Typically, this would be your operators or other on-site hands-on operations personnel. After this, we want to have a conversation with these guys or girls to learn what your operational issues are, either after or concurrently, the data required for the analysis should be extracted. It can be done by you or by us, depending on what is most efficient. Once we have the data, we analyze it and identify opportunities for improvement. We present these in a review where we prioritize them and you can decide which you would like us to proceed with. Of course, it is only when the improvement is ordered and implemented that any value is created. This example is for a one-time engagement but most of the most value is generated when, when these are subscription services, typically quarterly or, or monthly. Um, in that case, we perform the analysis at the agreed frequency and have historically been presenting them in regular meetings as well as sending across the agreed reports. However, we're working on changing the way we deliver these regular loop performance services. So instead of getting the data sent in batches, we util utilize our digital starter kit, including Edge Insight, to stream the data to our cloud. This data can also be forwarded to your cloud solution. Once the data is available, we use our in-house tools and expertise to analyze the data and provide suggested improvements for your asset. The interface we want to provide for this is a dashboard that combines the suggested improvements along with benchmark KPIs and agreed reports. The benefit for you will be an overview of your plant and how it is performing over time with regards to process operability. In addition, you will be able to access improvements analyzed by our specialists and based on our experience from the previously mentioned more than 40 sites and 150,000 hours of control room experience. Of course, any reports you have subscribed to would also be available, all in the same place, all accessible when you need it. Of course, the intention is that the overall indicators will become better as you implement improvements on your plant. So what we're trying to do is tie, is tie together the overall process performance with the individual loops behavior. And uh, if you think this sounds interesting, please reach out to us. Uh, in particular, if you're interested in being a pilot customer, we would very much like to hear from you. And if so, send an e email to either Thomas or myself. Our emails are shown uh, here on the screen.